Hi, I'm Ranger Caitlin, and welcome to Shenandoah National Park. Thousands of visitors come to Shenandoah every year, hoping to see some wildlife on their adventures. Of course, you do have to stay 25 yards away from wildlife in the park, 50 yards away from bears. But there is some wildlife in the park that some of us want to be even further away from. And no, I'm not talking about ticks. They're actually really could, very strong predators and they don't have limbs. There are 18 different species of snakes in Shenandoah National Park. In the comments, I want you to write what species do you think live here in Shenandoah? Or what have you already seen here in the park before? Snakes are ecotherms, meaning that they regulate their body temperature by the environment surrounding them. Like this warm sun that's coming out now. This would be great if I was a snake. They're, can, they're carnivores, predators. I often don't think of snakes as carnivores or predators in that fact, but they are, and they're very good at what they do. They either have a, a generalist diet or some of them have a more specialized diet. For example, the northern copperhead eats a variety of things, voles, mice, birds, other snakes, anything else probably that they can find. But the eastern hognose snake it has a more specialized diet. It eats primarily toads and sometimes a frog or a salamander. The common species seen in Shenandoah is the northern copperhead, the timber rattlesnake, the eastern garter snake, the northern water snake, the ringneck snake, and the eastern rat snake. You can go online to the park's website and download a list of all the species of reptiles in Shenandoah. There are two venomous snakes in Shenandoah, the northern copperhead and the timber rattlesnake. Well, one of the ways that you can tell the difference between a venomous snake and a non-venomous snake is the shape of their head. So a non-venomous snake, if you look at the interior of my hands here, that circle, has a more oval shaped head. And a venomous snake has a more triangular shaped head. Also, to me personally, I think venomous snakes, when you look at their profiles, has a pointed nose to them as well. Just in case if you don't really want to get that close to try to figure out whether that snake is venomous or not. Chances are, when you found out this program was about snakes, you had some strong emotions arise. People hardly feel indifferent, meh, about snakes. It's either they really like them, like arctologists, maybe some park rangers, or you really don't like them at all. Now, in the comments, I want you to fill out the blanks of the sentence. Snakes make me feel blank because blank. Snakes make me feel blank because blank. Snakes make me feel uncomfortable because they surprise me and I don't like surprises. Anytime I have led a group hike, I always let the people know, since I'm in front, you will know if I see a snake because an involuntary high-pitched noise will come out of me. In other words, I yelp very loudly. Please remember to be kind to others when responding to comments expressing how they feel about snakes. Snake's ability to startle us or surprise us is an adaptation they have in order to survive. What are some other adaptations that you think snakes have in order to survive? Camouflage, their ability to hide in the floors, on the forest floor, along river or stream beds, is one adaptation. Helps protect them from predators like us, as well as be able to hunt their prey and sneak up and surprise them. Snakes not having any limbs is another adaptation. It allows them to be able to move quietly through the forest floor, through rocks and leaves, to sneak up on their prey. It allows them to be able to hide in cracks or holes in the ground. Some adaptations are behavioral, like the ability to climb vertically to hunt for birds or bird eggs. You may see an eastern rat snake doing this, where they'll climb and arch their spine and climb vertically up a tree trunk 
or an old wall or a uh, wall of your home as well. It can be a little unnerving to see a snake climb a tree, but that's one adaptation they, are, they have. Another adaptation that snakes have is their ability to open their jaw really wide. They have extra limit, lig ligaments in there. That way they can swallow prey that's bigger than they are. They also have teeth inside that point inward to help direct food that may still be alive in the right direction that they're trying to eat. The rattles of a rattlesnake is another adaptation. The rattle of a rattlesnake is actually made up of keratin, the same material that makes up our fingernails as well. You cannot judge a snake by the number of rattles that they have. It's a good estimate, but not a, a great way to do it. Because a snake, a, a new rattle is born, born, a new rattle is created <laughs> every time a snake sheds its skin. And snakes shed their skin four to 12 times a year. And so that's every time that shin, skin is shedded. <laughs> that's a tongue twister again. Every time that skin is shed, it creates a new layer to its rattle. Now rattles being just like our fingernails, being made out of keratin, if they get too long, they can tear and break off. So that's why it's not an easy way or a good way to age a, a snake. What do you think are snakes predators? They have all these adaptations in order to help them survive. But what eat snakes? Here in Shenandoah, they have a, a, a wide range of predators. Coyotes, possums, bobcats, other snakes, birds of prey, fish will eat baby snakes or small snakes. We may not eat snakes most of the time. However, we are still a top predator to snakes. Humans may not eat snakes or actively hunt them, but we do lead to a large number of deaths of snakes. These danger noodles or rope nopes, well, they don't leave a very happy impression on some of us. But they are still important to the environment and maybe even to us as well. Just gonna leave, I'm gonna put down this nope rope. Snakes have been in religion, mythologies, folklore, since the beginning of time, really. But we tend to only remember the negative ones. But there's a lot of, a lot of stories that have snakes in a positive light as well. Here in the United States, in the Southwest, some of the Pueblo tribes view snakes as a symbol of fertility and renewing the fertility of nature. Some mythologies see snakes as messengers between the upper world and the lower world because they live in cracks in the ground. So it can leave messages to the people who have passed beyond us and back down to the lower world. Some cultures view snakes as symbols of immortality because they shed their skins and are reincarnated and have a second life or third or fourth life. Some cultures view them as symbols of eternity as they create coils and, became, and we create circles, the sign of eternity. Snakes are associated with wisdom in many mythologies because it always looks like they're pondering their thought before they strike. In Northern Europe and West Africa, snakes are associated with healing properties. If you look around, you may notice a lot of pharmaceutical companies, uh, ambulances do have snakes on their emblems as well. So some of the species being venomous does kind of put a, a bitter taste in our mouths for some people. It makes us hesitant to like them, maybe even makes us scared of them. 
but that venom is very important. Not only is it important to the snake, as it is how they hunt and eat, but there may be aspects of things that we can learn from it as well. Scientists are doing research to see how different snake venom can be used to help treat cancer. For example, in the northern copperhead, the, nor the copperhead venom proteins actually attack and stick to cancer cells in the research that they're doing. It prevents cancer cells from sticking to places they shouldn't be or requesting aid from other cancer cells. This venom could also help out with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, strokes. So there's some more research that needs to be done. There may be a correlation between timber rattlesnakes and Lyme disease. Timber rattlesnakes eat a lot of small mammals that carry ticks. So it may not be a horrible thing to have around your house sometimes. Research also needs to be looked at how snakes can survive such fast acceleration. They can strike within one tenth of a human blink. I don't think that's right. One tenth of a second, half the time of human blink. This is where I was at. <laughs> For human pilots, they will lose consciousness in less than one fourth of the amount of energy that takes the snake to strike. How can they do that? How can they survive that over and over again? We've talked about a behavioral adaption, a behavioral adaptation earlier about snakes being able to climb trees. Well, all snakes have the ability to do that, but some of them don't. More research needs to look into the social complexities of snakes. It's always thought that snakes are singular, that they spend all their time alone. But what we're seeing now is that there are many species of snakes that actually commune together in dens throughout hibernation. Some species, like rattlesnakes, will even come together at those hibernation dens to give birth. The females will gather to give birth and then babysit each other's babies while they go out to hunt or bask in the sun. So there's more to learn about these little creepy crawly guys that kind of give some of us the heebie-jeebies. The best way that you can help snakes is by just letting them be. Let them persist. Some hiking tips would be to stay on the trail and don't put your hands or feet in places that you can't see. If you do happen to see a snake, give it its space. Just avoid it. That's the best thing to do. If you do come across the snake and it looks like the situation is just too dangerous, maybe it's too close to the trail and it's unsafe for you to go around it and off the trail, come let a park ranger know and they can move it to a safer location. There are three species that you're commonly going to see here in Shenandoah. The timber rattlesnake, the northern copperhead, and the northern water snake. Now the northern water snake is often seen here at Rapinan Camp in Shenandoah National Park. It's often seen in the sunny spots along rocks, sunning themselves and warming up, and communally as well. Scientists still need to figure out the complexities of their social nature. Some snakes clearly do have friends that they will tolerate basking with, and not friends that they really don't want to be around and don't want in the same basking area as well. At Rapid Ant Camp, you can often see them basking together. Learning more about snakes can help us understand them and maybe even appreciate them more from a distance still, but maybe even appreciate them more. I hope the next time you see a snake in Shenandoah, you view it with a little bit of a different perspective. There's still so much to learn about snakes, their social complexities, their lives, and how maybe they could even help out our lives as well. Maybe even some things we could learn from the rattle itself. Each rattle is its own individual piece. By itself, it doesn't make much of a noise and isn't that strong. But when together, it's stronger and 
makes a noise that's loud enough to warn everybody around them. I would like to read you a quote from Benjamin Franklin that talks about rattlesnakes and see if you think or agree with what he says. She never begins an attack, nor when once engaged ever surrenders. She is therefore an emblem of magnanimity and true courage. I'm Ranger Kaylin, and thank you for joining me on a virtual ranger program here at Shenandoah National Park. Be sure to check us out on social media to see more ranger programs. And happy World Snake Day. We hope you see some of our friends while you visit. Ah, I'm stuck. <laughs> An emblem of magnanimity, 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 and welcome to Shenandoah National Park. See, <laughs> what are some other adaptions or adaptations? That's the word. Can I put it on my hat like that? <laughs> More than I signed up for. <laughs> Testing my acting limits here. <laughs> these hats are not cool. It seriously flies. I'm Ranger Caitlin. Oh my gosh. Okay. Happy World Snake Day. <laughs> Hello everyone. Welcome to Shenandoah National Park. I am Ranger Lauren and welcome to this beautiful, lush national park. Now, of course, people come here to enjoy the beautiful mountain vistas, to take in all of the beauty that we have here. But do they know that we are surrounded by poison? No, I'm not talking about the 80s hairband. I am talking about the stuff that Professor Plum used in the billiards room. The stuff that is the centerpiece of 41 out of 66 of Agatha Christie's murder mysteries. The fate of Romeo, Juliet, and Hamlet. Ultimately, the satiating end of King Joffrey. So poison is this beautiful substance that of course can cause illness or even death when absorbed or ingested by a human form. And it has been used by, by families and kingdoms for centuries, not only in plays and in a fantastic HBO series, but in the five kingdoms. I'm talking about animals, plants, bacteria, protists, and fungi. All kingdoms trying to outwit each other in this evolutionary arms race that is here present today in Shenandoah National Park. As a park ranger, it is my job to make sure that you stay poison free and there you might come in contact, you might brush shoulder, you might brush face even with poison ivy. Now, if you have come in contact with poison ivy before, you're sure not to forget it. I'd love to hear your poison ivy stories down in the comment section below. Poison ivy is incredibly notorious and it is so because it causes a disgusting, blistery red rash anywhere that it touches. And it's not the leaf that's poisonous, all parts of it are, from the leaf, the stem, the berries, you name it. It's all because of a compound called urushal. Urushal is incredibly potent and it causes basically our immune systems to attack healthy skin cells. So it's not the poison that's attacking you, it's your own body. Oh, the betrayal. Oh, the trickery. Brilliant. This is poison at its finest, if you will. And the cool thing about urushal is it doesn't take a lot to have big effects. About two chapsticks worth of urushal would cause enough to give everyone in the world that disgusting, beautiful red rash that, you, that poison ivy is so famous for. Minty fresh. Anytime that you think that you may have come in contact with poison ivy, it's incredibly important to rinse off, soap up, and then rinse off again to push all of that oil that might be on your skin off of it so you can stay silky smooth. Now the problem is, is that poison ivy is incredibly morphologically diverse, which is ranger speak for it looks really different 
in lots of different ways. It can be a shrub, it can be a vine, it can just be a little plant on the ground. Its leaves can be serrated or they can be smooth. Sometimes leaves are even waxy. So this huge diversity in what this plant can look like can be hard for you to identify. But there's one thing that you have to remember. Leaves of three, leave it be. So let's do a little quiz here. I'm gonna throw up four different images of different plants you could find out here in Shenandoah. And which one do you think is poison ivy? Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, it's important to remember that leaves of three, things like Virginia creeper can be on a vine, but they're not going to have those leaves of three. Ultimately, this rule of three is going to be the thing that keeps you safe and not covered in a rash. Awesome. Poison ivy can be found throughout the park. So you might be asking yourself, wait, why doesn't all the wildlife have a rash? Why are we the only ones that react? Right? It'd be a completely different park if you all drove here to Shenandoah, get out of the car, and out in the bushes are just red, rashy, alopecia, balding deer, right? This would be completely different. And that's because our deer here don't react to urushal or poison ivy. It is only humans and a few species of primates that do react. It's because not only do they have fur that protects them, but their skin chemistry is completely different from ours, leaving us the only ones that are susceptible to the evil, brilliant rash that is formed by poison ivy. You might be thinking to yourself, Ranger Lauren, this doesn't make any sense. Why would poison ivy spend all of this energy making poison that doesn't even help itself defend against ferocious deer fawns or fluffy birds? Well, you're right, my friend. The eternal enemy of plants is in fact herbivores, things that eat plants, right? Plants can't move, so they make poison to defend themselves. But they also make poison to defend themselves against other things, things that we can't necessarily see. Two big, of big kingdoms are protists and bacteria, right? Little tiny microbes that we can't see. And just like you and I can get infections, so can plants. So that is why poison ivy has urushal flowing through all of its sap. Essentially, it makes its own Clorox wipes, if you will. So you and I have to race down the aisles of Walmart, fighting each other for the last tube of Clorox wipes. Our poison ivy just makes them in its own body. Pretty crazy when you think about it. And plants are tremendously good at making poison all around. Now, milkweed might seem like an unassuming plant, but it is anything but. Even without its bloom, our milkweed here is a heart stopper. So if we were to look at the milky substance it makes within its leaves, in there we can find cardiac glycosids, which literally have the power to stop your heart. Poison, am I right? So cool. Now, our milkweed is this poisonous because it has been embroiled in a battle for thousands of years at this point, under a relentless siege by caterpillars. Now, let's go to the battle scene now. So my caterpillar friend here, it should be dead. Our milkweed has tons of poison ready for it, but here we are watching it work its magic. This caterpillar is immune to milkweed's poisons. And what we are looking at is an evolutionary battle. As our milkweed gets more poisonous, our cat monarch caterpillar gets more immunity. More poison, more immunity, more poison, more immunity. More defense met by more counter defense over and over and over again. It's just like what your sports coach taught you, right? Defense wins games. And this game, of course, is evolution. Monarchs are not only immune to the poison, but they become the poison. As they become their butterfly form, they become flying poison. And you will be able to see them flying through the skies in their vibrant patterns, warning predators of their poison, their poison being. And birds that decide to take a snack of our monarch will quickly start vomiting. And that's why our lovely monarch can wear such sassy, wonderful colors like this. Woo! These vibrant colors say to predators, stay away, I am poisonous. And that's why you can see monarchs flitting about fields carelessly, right? Because they aren't scared. They have the wrath of the monarch. Woo! And just like our monarch with its brilliant color and its vibrant pattern, 
our salamanders also have them too. Salamanders, all of them, if not most of them, are in fact poisonous. The cool thing is, is that their different colors and stripes mean the same thing as our monarch butterfly. Now you might be like, whoa, stay away from the salamanders. And you should because they're very, very, very fragile creatures. Their skin is super absorbent. So when we touch salamanders, not only are we at risk of harming ourselves, but we also could hurt the salamanders. The salts, the oils, the bug spray, the sunscreen that are on our hands can ultimately hurt and possibly kill our wonderful Shenandoah salamanders. Whether you are high on the mountaintops, in the meadows, forests, or streams, here in Shenandoah, you are going to be surrounded by poison. Now, the story of poison is rich and complex. It is a timeless story that is far more universal than that of two prepubescent star-crossed lovers or doomed tyrants. It is the story of five kingdoms competing not for glory, not for greatness, but for survival. So when we are out here enjoying Shenandoah National Park, we can find poison in lots of places. Now, of course, we're not going to find it in our bears or any apex predators, those that are at the top of the food chain. We not need be afraid of poison when it comes to them, other things maybe. But poison is everywhere and we can do our part to defend ourselves. Ultimately, poison is a defense. So it's important to remember to stay on the trail and respect wildlife and hopefully you will be able to find beauty and peace out here in Shenandoah and allow it to poison your mind. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I hope to see you out on the trail soon. Bye!